This is your USMNT Abroad Weekend Update from March 29th to March 31st of 2024. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo and welcome to Tactical Manager TV and welcome to the US Men's National Team Abroad series where every single Monday we update you on how the Yanks did abroad over the weekend. Now before we start this weekend recap, I want to quickly talk about Harry Kane. I, I promise it'll take like 30 seconds. I just really feel bad for this guy. Like a lot. Harry Kane is probably the best unlucky player of all time. It's seriously unreal. This brother right here, Harry Kane, joined Bayern Munich. And he's been fantastic for them. And they are about to go trophyless for the first time in the past 12 to 13 years. You can take the man out of Tottenham, but you can't take the Tottenham out of the man. It's unreal because when he decided to leave Tottenham, he could make like a sideways move, which means he would probably not win a trophy, or he could go up, which would be teams like Manchester City, Liverpool, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Barcelona. Um, and, and many others that are ahead of like Tottenham in terms of winning a trophy. But out of all the options he had, Bayern was the easy choice if you want to win a trophy. I mean, they would have won something, the German Cup, Champions League, Bundesliga, that they've won, what, the past, like, 10 editions. But as soon as this guy arrives, they pretty much lose everything. And, and trust me, they're probably going to lose to Arsenal in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. If they don't lose in the quarterfinals the way they've been playing, they're probably going to lose in the semifinals. So I just really feel bad for this guy. With that said, just sit back, relax, hit the like button, get some popcorn, or don't get some popcorn. Do whatever you want, and let's start the Americans Abroad Weekend recap. As always, we start the top five leagues in Europe, the first one being the English Premier League, and you start by hitting the like button to help us hit 1,000 likes in this video for absolutely no reason, to be honest. And with that said, Let's talk about Gio Reyna and Matt Turner from Nottingham Forest, along with Chris Richards from Crystal Palace, because they clashed over the weekend. And this kind of hurt. I should probably not hit my hands like this hard. It hurts. And on Saturday, Gio Reyna started off the bench and was sent in around minute 60 for Nottingham Forest during their 1-1 draw with Crystal Palace. Matt Turner stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes. As for Chris Richards, he started and played the full 90 minutes for Crystal Palace as a left center back in the back three. Defensively, Chris Richards was very good, but I don't think he was very good on the ball. The passing was very meh. He was not great on distribution. That has to improve, and we have seen Richards do better on the ball in the Bundesliga and even in the Premier League for Crystal Palace. As for Gio Reyna, I thought Gio was very good. His individual performance was good, but also from a tactical standpoint that I'm going to talk about in a second. Gio hit a nice left-footed shot on target. He also did set up Morgan Gibbs-White for the cross that was the assist. So what I'm saying here is Gio Reyna got what we call a hockey assist, which is the pass that leads to the assist to the goal. I know many of you hate the term hockey assist, but Gio had a small involvement in that goal. It was tiny, but they probably would not have scored without him. And understand, it's not just about the pass. It's the whole tactical approach that changes when Gio Reyna is on the field for Nottingham Forest. When he's on, he usually plays the 10, and that forces Morgan Gibbs-White to play the 8 much deeper, which if you think about it for that specific goal, that is literally how or why that goal happened. Gio was higher up the field. He passed it back to Morgan Gibbs-White. That was deeper at the 8 position. He got the cross, and Nottingham Forest scored. I think Nottingham Forest played a lot better when they had Gio at the 10 and Gibbs-White down deeper at the 8. But I'm not the coach. I'm not Nuno Espirito Santo. So that doesn't really matter. Those are just my thoughts. So again, I'm not a big fan of the term hockey assist, but I do think it's worth mentioning in specific situations like this one. Now let's move on and talk about the boys that play for Fulham. And they are Anthony Robinson and Tim Ream, along with Austin Trusty because he plays for Sheffield and Sheffield faced Fulham over the weekend. And on Saturday, Robinson started and played the full 90 minutes for Fulham during their 3-3 draw with Sheffield. Tim Ream stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes, while Austin Trusty came off the bench at the 85th minute for Sheffield when they actually had a 3-1 lead. Then they conceded a goal one minute after Trusty was subbed in, and later on they obviously conceded the third goal because this match ended 3-3 
during added time. And to be fair, none of those goals were on Trusty. As for Robinson, he was really good going forward. He got two shots on target. He could have had an assist. However, defensively, Robinson was not great. He had a lot or at least some degree of blame on all three goals conceded by Fulham. I won't go into details because you can just go watch the highlights and you'll see that he was at fault on all three goals to some degree, some more than others. I can't really show the highlights here or they'll take down the channel, but it's very easy to see where he was at fault. What's my point? Anthony Robinson can do better defensively. We know he can, but this game wasn't one of them. He didn't play well defensively. And that's one of the reasons why Sheffield was able to even hold on or not even pull this draw because they had a 3-1 lead late in the game. But I mean, Fulham should have won it. And Anthony Robinson can do better. Still in the Premier League, we have Tyler Adams from Bournemouth. And on Saturday, Tyler Adams started and went to distance by playing the full 90 minutes for Bournemouth during their 2-1 win over Everton. First and foremost, Tyler Adams is clearly 90 minutes fit. Then I would also like to point out that Bournemouth got this win due to a bizarre own goal scored by Everton at added time. But it doesn't matter. A win is a win. And Bournemouth got the win with Tyler Adams playing the entire match. But with that said, how did Tyler do? And let's start by saying that Tyler Adams got man of the match at foot mob for whatever that's worth. Now, my question to you is, was he the best performer of the match? And that's honestly debatable. But was he one of the best performers of the match? And yes, absolutely. He was to a bare minimum, a top three. Tyler didn't look rusty at all. He had a solid performance protecting that back line counter pressing and playing it safe on the ball the injury hasn't really slowed him down and looks more or less like the same tyler adams we saw for leads just a bit smarter off the ball and less aggressive which honestly i prefer some claimed he got lucky to not have gotten a penalty kick called against him but honestly, it wasn't really a penalty kick. The ref agrees with me, and I believe Calvert-Lewin kind of flopped in that play. When you take into account the fact that Tyler Adams hasn't played for 12 months, I would say this was one fantastic performance. And before we move on, there's one thing I'd like to say about some of the crazy people on Twitter or X. When I praise Tyler Adams for a good performance, I'm not backtracking on my Johnny take that I think Johnny can become the starting six for the U.S. men's national team. He will challenge and push Tyler Adams. Right now, it's obviously Tyler. When I praise Tyler, I am not backtracking on that take. I'm praising Tyler because he deserves praise. There is no narrative. That's my point. There is no Johnny narrative. I could choose to ignore Tyler Adams' good performances, but I don't do that because what I want is for the best player to play in their respective positions and right now tyler's probably the best six we have and he'll continue to start but johnny can 100 percent challenge him that's the take so don't try to say that i'm pushing a narrative don't do any of that because when tyler plays well i will say it i will report on it i will not ignore it so you want to know what the narrative is i want our best players to start for the national team that's all so don't be a muppet on twitter or x now let's leave the fish and chip merchants and go to the pizza merchants in Italy and talk about the Americans that play in the Serie A. The first two being Christian Pulisic and Yunus Musa from AC Milan. And on Saturday, Pulisic and Musa both start off the bench for Milan during their 2-1 win over Fiorentina. Musa was subbed in around minute 63, while Christian Pulisic was sent in around minute 73. Both substitutions happened when Milan already had a 2-1 lead. And let me tell you, Yunus Musa pissed me off. We literally could have had a Musa assist with a Pulisic goal. And Musa took that away from us. I love Yunus Musa, but for this specific game, he pissed me off. There was a moment where Musa was driving the ball forward, as he always does super well while dribbling, but this time Pulisic was making a perfect run down the right, cutting inside. Musa could have just put on a through ball to Pulisic, and you know, he didn't. He took too long. But it's Musa, you know, he can't pass. He can just run with the ball forever. Just like run, run, run like Forrest Gump with absolutely no purpose. By the time Musa released the ball and sent the pass to Pulisic, he was offside. And to make things worse, Pulisic still managed to score with a wonderful finish, but obviously it was disallowed because he was offside. Because Yunus Musa 
held the ball for too long. And it'll probably take me a full week to get over this. Besides that, Yunus Musa did fine. He had a good performance. The only thing that bothers me about Musa right now is that over the past two seasons or so, roughly, right, 24 months, he showed very little progress. He's a good player, but I haven't seen much improvement in his game for the past like 24 months. As for Pulisic, he looked dangerous in limited minutes. He looked sharp and confident. He also almost scored during added time with a nice left footed shot that was saved by the goalkeeper. And Musa usually comes off the bench for Milan. Pulisic was probably going to start, but he played a lot of minutes for the US men's national team. It traveled quite a bit right from Texas to Italy. So he was probably just being rested. He's most likely going to start the next match for Milan. With that said, let's leave the Milan players and go to the Juve players, Wesson McKenney and Tim Weah. And on Saturday, McKenney and Weah both start off the bench for Juve during their 1-0 loss to Lazio. McKenney was subbed in at halftime and Tim Weah was subbed in around minute 63. They did okay, nothing bad, nothing great. Juve was just once again terrible to watch and honestly, they deserve to lose late in the game for putting me through this agonizing pain that is to watch Allegri ball. Allegri ball is just pure torture. It, it's horrible. This guy is a legitimate like soccer terrorist. Watching Juve under Allegri, it's like tying someone down and forcing them to watch the Mean Girls remake without allowing them to close their eyes. It's just awful. And I understand that Juventus will probably get top four, but they got to get rid of Allegri this summer, man. Unless McKennie and Tim Weah leave, then I don't really care because then I won't really have to watch Juventus anyway. This was one of the weekends that I wish I just skipped their game against Lazio. With that said, before we continue, drop a like in this video and a quick word from our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Their link is in the description of this video. We'll be back in a minute. And thank you, Underdog Fantasy, for sponsoring Tactical Manager TV. Underdog Fantasy is a fun game to play prior to any soccer match or basketball or football as well but we don't talk about those two in tactical manager tv sometimes basketball during live watch alongs i have been playing underdog fantasy for over a year now you can download the app by using the link on the description of this video and you can also use the promo code tmtv and underdog will be matching your first deposit for up to $100. And in the process, you'll be helping the channel avoid bankruptcy. The game I mainly play is called Pick'em. You just click on it, scroll to the soccer section, and pick a player for a specific match and select the stats that you believe will be lower or higher. It's very easy to play, but be smart about your picks because it's not easy to win. I'll be playing some underdog fantasy during some match live streams or match live watch alongs, so stay tuned for that as I will be forced to cheer for a player or root against him. Now, I am a professional hater, so I'll probably be rooting for the player's downfall. Once again, don't forget to use the promo code TMTV and use the link on the description of this video. Thank you, Underdog Fantasy, for sponsoring the champ. Next up are the Americans that play in Germany in the Bundesliga, the first one being Brendan Aronson from Union Berlin. And on Saturday, Brendan Aronson started and played 65 minutes for Union Berlin during their 0-0 draw with Eintracht Frankfurt. And what if I told you that Brendan Aronson played well once again for Union Berlin? He seriously did. It's the second consecutive match. Would you believe me? Well, I got news for you. He played well, at least in the first half. He was very good in the first half, blowing by the opponents, very press resistant. He just wasn't great in the final third with his finishing and final pass. But Aronson was actually quite good in the first half. Second half, not so much. He played 20 minutes. But we're seeing a different Brendan Aronson ever since he got left out of the roster and then he got included due to injuries. Played well the last match for Union Berlin before international break and he did it again. Next up would have been John Brooks from Hoffenheim, but unfortunately he was suspended over the weekend so he didn't play. So let's skip John Brooks and talk about Joe Scali and Pifak from Borussia Mönchengladbach. And on Saturday, Joe Scali and Pifak both started for Gladbach during their 3-0 loss to Freiburg in the Bundesliga. Pifak played 62 minutes and Joe Scali played 75 minutes. Let's say they didn't play well and Scali was a bit shaky on defense for this occasion. Scali might want to stop getting beat on the back post. That's all I'll say. Joe Scali is also just 21 and he continues to gain valuable experience in the Bundesliga. So I'm not overly concerned for him over the long term but just like Yunus Musa I want to see him take a big step forward next season not in terms of transfer but just in terms of his development the way he plays I want to see a better Scali on the field because just like Yunus Musa for the past season or two roughly Scali and Musa seem like they kind of stagnated in terms of their level of play 
that's what I've been observing. So hopefully he does show a lot of improvement for next season when he's still playing for Borussia, not Dortmund. Next up, we have Kevin Paredes from Wolfsburg. And on Saturday, Paredes started and played the full 90 minutes for Wolfsburg during their 2-0 win over Werder Bremen in the Bundesliga. Last but not least, we have Leonard Maloney from Heidenheim. And on Sunday, Maloney was back from injury for Heidenheim and he was subbed in the 90th minute during their 3-3 draw with Stuttgart. He was sent in late to help them hold a draw, which unfortunately they did not. They conceded during added time. But the good news here is that Maloney is back. And now we can leave Germany and go to Spain. The first player would have been Luca De La Torre from Celta de Vigo, but he's still dealing with an injury and he was not available for Celta de Vigo this weekend. So we're going to skip on Luca De La Torre and go to Johnny Cardoso from Real Betis. And on Sunday, Johnny stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Real Betis during their 3-2 loss to Girona. He was probably being rested after international break. This was the first DNP that he got for Real Betis ever since he made his debut back in January against Barcelona. So we'll see what happens next week. Many Americans that normally start for their clubs, they came off the bench or they didn't play much this weekend like Christian Pulisic, McKinney, Balogun, including Johnny. I'm assuming it was due to travel because of the international break but we'll see if johnny's on the bench next weekend that means maybe he has gotten benched for real betis we'll find out in seven days now let's go to france and talk about following balogun from monaco and on saturday balogun started off the bench and was subbed in the 66 minute for monaco during their 5-2 win over mets and let's get the important information out of the way and that is that balogun got a brace he scored two goals this match the first goal was a brendan aronson like goal as pointed out by our dear friend on twitter bob morocco balogun pressed the goalkeeper forcing the mistake and pretty much scored off a blocked pass so good press from balogun and a moronic decision from the goalkeeper now the second goal was actually a very nice right-footed finish off a cross the fact of the matter here is that balogun can still be productive even when he is in poor form. Look at this. He actually has seven goals and four assists in league uh, this season. That's 11 goal contributions while wasting four penalty kicks. He's on track to get over 15 goal contributions in a top five league this season, which would make it the second consecutive season that he does so. He hasn't been great this season, just to be honest. But look at that. Even with the poor performances, he is still managing to be productive in a very competitive environment. And I know a lot of you are pissed off because I do defend Balogun quite a bit. I, I see it in the comment section. But let me ask you one question. How many American forwards have the ability to get two consecutive seasons at age 22, right? It's 22, 23, to get 15 goal contributions in a top five league? Two consecutive seasons. Last season, he had 20 plus. This season, it's probably gonna end around 15 to 20, somewhere between that. How many American forwards can do that? And understand, I agree with you. He's not having a good season. But imagine if he was. My point, I still think Balogun is the best center forward we have. And hopefully he picks up good form for the U.S. men's national team as well. Now let's leave France and go to the Netherlands and talk about the Americans that play in the Eredivisie. And why don't we start the boys that play for PSV? They are Malik Tillman, Serginho Dest and Ricardo Pepe. And on Saturday, PSV actually took their first L in the Eredivisie this season. They lost 3-1 to NEC. As for the Americans, Des started and played the full 90 minutes. Tillman came off the bench at halftime and Ricardo Pepe was subbed in at the 59th minute. Des did okay. He was even able to draw a penalty kick that was wasted by Luke de Jong. Tillman and Pepe didn't really play well, in my opinion. Tillman was probably the worst of the three, but I don't think Tillman and Pepe really had a good performance. But overall, it just wasn't a good game from PSV. Almost every single player had a poor performance, which is why they lost. The next player would have been Taylor Booth from Utrecht, but he's still injured, so we're going to skip on Taylor and go to Paxton Aronson from Vitesse. And on Saturday, Paxton started and played the full 90 minutes for Vitesse during their 2-0 loss to AZ Alkmaar. Now let's go back to the United Kingdom and talk about the Americans that play in the second division of England. The first one being Josh Sargent from Norwich. And on Friday, Sargent started and played the full 90 minutes for Norwich during their 2-1 win over Plymouth. Plymouth, whatever way you pronounce it in England. Sargent scored for Norwich to tie the game halfway through the second half, essentially leading their comeback win. The goal is a nice right-footed finish off a somewhat low cross off a corner. Sargent now has 14 goals in the EFL Championship this season with less than 1,300 minutes played. And hear me out, Norwich is still fighting for a spot in the Premier League. I don't think they'll get promoted. 
However, I could see a Premier League, a lower to mid-table Premier League side, possibly signing Sargent after this fantastic season that he's been having in the EFL Championship. But now that we're done with Sargent, let's talk about another American forward that's scoring a lot of goals in the EFL Championship, and he even scored for the U.S. Men's National Team this international break, and his name is Haji Wright, and he plays for Coventry. On Friday, Haji Wright started and played the full 90 minutes for Coventry as a left winger during their 3-1 win over Huddersfield, and he scored, again, this time with a powerful left-footed strike. He got the ball at the edge of the box, he cut to his left foot, and hit a very good diagonal shot. Haji Wright has 14 goals and 6 assists this season for Coventry, in the EFL Championship. Next up, we have Ethan Horvath from Cardiff City. And on Friday, Horvath started and played the full 90 minutes for Cardiff during their 2-0 loss to Sunderland. Still in the UK, we're going to go to Scotland and talk about Cameron Carter-Vickers from Celtic. And on Sunday, Carter-Vickers started and played the full 90 minutes for Celtic during their 3-0 win over Livingston in Scotland. Last but not least, we have the Americans abroad that play in Mexico. And before I even get to that, and if you made it this far in the video, Please hit the like button right now if you haven't already and consider joining our Patreon to support the channel along with the many perks that you gain from it. So let's talk about the Americans that play in Liga MX. The first one being Alejandro Zendejas from Club America. Unfortunately, he's not available for Club America right now. He is dealing with a hamstring injury. However, Chivas and Monterrey clashed over the weekend. So Cade Cowell faced Brandon Vasquez. And on Saturday, Cade Cal started and played 73 minutes for Chivas during their 2-0 win over Monterrey. The first goal they scored was an own goal, but at the same time, it was a bit of a Cade Cal goal as well. Let me explain. What happened was Cade Cal hit a shot on target, the goalkeeper saved it, but didn't hold on to the ball. The rebound hit the center back and went into the back of the net. So what do we call this? Does it count as a goal contribution for Cade Cal? Not really. But it should count as something, I guess. I don't know what to call it. As for Brendan Vasquez, he came off the bench at halftime for Monterey. By then, the game was still 0-0, but they were playing man down. So could we just say that Cade Cal scored or got an assist? Not really, but sort of, right? You get the point that I'm making. All right, everyone, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to drop a like before you go. It's a great way to support the channel. And thank you, everyone, that has been joining our Patreon. We truly appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you very much for watching. We'll drop an episode on Wednesday, and we're also going to have an episode on Thursday involving our domestic soccer. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.